you haven't gotten to hear back from me, I will respond in the next day. Um, and probably some of you have contacted uh, Well, you got me. You know about home. Okay, no one responded to Jonathan. He did it all right the first time. Um, anyway, so home one, check your story. As I wrote the email, unfortunately, I mean, it's important that everyone sort of, you know, not feel like, oh, I got the tough grader or the easy grader or whatever. And yet some of us were different. Overall averages, who knows why. So I added points to the people who were low, um, and as you said, many of you saw, roughly half of you got extra points. So the extra points are, if you got five extra points, it probably means if you had been scored by somebody else, your average would have been five points higher. Of course, I don't really know that. But I think it makes it overall fair, though in any individual case, hard to know. So it's unfortunate. Um, okay, so that's homework one. I think any questions probably people have are sort of related to your individual homework, but you have anyone have general questions on homework one? Or we fire homework three. Okay, let's talk about homework three, because that's that's due. And let me just review it. So the main news on homework three is that you have software to use. So that's good. Let's review homework three for a minute. So remember that you will design test cases for Sabubi's capability to select and rank substitutes for a particular teacher's absence. Okay? So that make sure you're, what you're doing focuses on that. Sabubi ranking substitutes based on a particular teacher's absence. Okay? So we've been with the even with the very, we, all we've given you is a really sliver of sabubi. If there was a complete sabubi, it would obviously have lots more to it. But even with that little sliver, you could test other things. So let's just lo look at that little sliver. Okay. So also, if you have a wider screen, it will look better because it's sort of it's sort of wide. Um, anyone have any trouble running Sabubi yet? Their web, page, their web browsers didn't accept it? Okay, it's using some kind of advanced features, but probably most of you have web browsers that are in the last three or four years, so it should work. Uh, but you might check that out if you're not sure, and not wait till like the last five minutes. Okay, so um, suppose, so for instance, one thing I can do is I can add another substitute teacher. So I can add Dan Frost, and I can type in an invalid social security number, maybe. I can type it in at least, right? It may or may not accept it. If I said, okay, my test, I'm going to test whether I'm, use, I'm putting in a valid social security number, would that be in the spirit of the homework assignment? No. Absolutely not. Okay, you will really not get many points if your test case is validity of social security number. Is that because we really don't care about social security numbers? No. It's because the assignment said, oops, Sabubi's capability to select and rank substitutes for a particular teacher's absence. So there's many, many other parts of Sabubi, even in this little sliver, but that's not what I'm asking you to test. Okay, so I just want to make sure this is really clear because some people get really fascinated by invalid data being typed in. And invalid data is absolutely something you need to test in general, but every assignment says do this. Just like if you took a math class and they said add 2 plus 3, you might say, well, I'm not really interested in 2 plus 3. I'm going to give you the answer of 4 plus 7. Well, you probably wouldn't get much credit, right? So, so just be aware. What you're testing is, so, so does the system allow you to type in an invalid social security number? Has anyone actually tested that? Good, no one's messing up. <laughs> it probably does. Um, I asked Chris to, in the interest of time, to not do too much, oh, there we go. Not to do too much editing on the user input. So just be aware of that. That's not the point we're, that's not what we're trying to test. Now, if you find, as I said in the email, if you find that there's some flaw in the user interface, that prevents you from creating the test case that you're interested in, 
please let me know, and I'll fix that. Okay? But if it's just a flaw in the user interface that allows invalid data to be entered, I'm not that interested in it, because I, first of all, I know about that, and that's not what you're trying to test. Okay? So I just want to really be really clear, because I know I'm going to get a lot of homework threes that say, okay, my basis is validity of uh, you know, whether the social security number is numeric or something like that, and we're going to feel bad, kind of, for saying, okay, but you're not going to get a lot of points because the first thing was, the, the, the main thing is what are you trying to test, okay? So let me be clear on that. Has any, the other thing that I just want to make sure you know is that once, you, you know, we have some substitute teachers built in, as I said, if you don't like them, you don't want to test Martin Luther because you're Catholic or something. Just joking. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're sort of a thorn in the side of Catholics. Uh, and if, you know, any of these people, boy, someone chose sort of politicized substitute teachers here. <laughs> Except for Dan Frost. So you can always add Dan Frost. I have no political leanings whatsoever. Um, hired teachers, okay, Marie Curie, I think we all like her, and I'm not sure I know who these other people are. Anyway, um, so then we can, so it, it turns out, for instance, that um, the first two substitutes are missing a class. We don't even have really any sense of date in the system. It's just for the next day, okay? So it's just yes or no. So Marie Curie and Carolyn Herschel, is she the one of the greatest astronomers who discovered Saturn or something like that? Neptune? Uranus? Is that a parallel in her place? Yeah. Okay. German astronomer. Sorry, what? She was a German astronomer. German astronomer. English! German British astronomer. German British, okay. She was born in Germany, moved to Britain, did her discoveries in Britain, right? Uh, Keep reading Wikipedia and report back. <laughs> okay. I don't think I ever have said that before in class. Okay. So we can generate report. And we get our results, and we can see that for Marie Curie, the teacher to substitute, there was nobody good. So that's interesting. That might be test worthy in some way. And for Carolyn Herschel, there were two substitutes. Eleanor Roosevelt, who's good because she already substituted for Carolyn Herschel, and Harvey Milk whose points are 138. So that's the sort of thing you're testing. Is, is this correct that Eleanor Roosevelt gets ranked first because she already substituted for Carolyn Herschel and Harvey Mudd gets ranked second because and he has 138 points? That's the sort of thing I want you to focus on, okay? That's where I'm not sure that the algorithm is correctly implemented. Okay? So just to kind of go over the, the idea behind equivalence partitioning, you want us to take a particular set of valid inputs. Okay, so, so let's go back to the idea behind, because that's where I was going to next. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, how do we do this? So I, I, just, want to, I just want to have the lecture slides up in front of us. Okay, so let's do the, we'll do the testing, but I want to start before your question. As I wrote you an email, three or four people asked me, I don't even know where to start. So you start at step one, decide what to test. However, make sure your decision is the same as my decision. <laughs> I've already decided what to test. But even within, within the very, the somewhat limited scope of ranking, substitute ranking for uh, absence, um, there still are, you'll, you'll, if you think about it, you'll see that there's maybe things within that. You know, that even that function is, has got some, some width, some breadth to it. You'll need to focus it. But make sure you don't go off on a different tangent and say, well, what I'm really interested in is whether you can put in a uh, invalid school or something like that. That's not what we're interested in. Okay. So once you've decided this, which pretty much is decided for you, go on to select a test case input. How do you do that? You use equivalence partitioning. It's a systematic approach. And step one is identify the set of all possible inputs. We won't do that in class, because that's part of the homework. 
But what are the inputs to this process of ranking substitutes? Well, I don't think I'm giving anything away to say. It's something to do with substitutes. It's something to do with higher teachers. And maybe it has other things. Yeah, I want you to be a little more specific than that. So that's why I don't think I'm giving anything away. And that's actually part of the document that you'll turn in. There's a section that says, what is the set of all possible inputs? And you'll describe that. Don't enumerate the set. Describe the set. OK? So once you've done that, then I think I've asked you twice to identify a basis for subdividing the set of inputs. And now I think we're at your question. So can you restate your question? And go. I was just going to, to make sure that the, the way we do equivalence partitioning is we take the all, the, the set of all possible inputs, and then we split it into reasonable subsets. And then we take a sample of each subset and test those. That is correct, so I'll add one thing. But the statement was we take, once we've identified the set of all possible inputs, we break it into reasonable subsets. And let me just add to that, we first define a basis or on which to break it, with which to break it into reasonable subsets. So maybe you would have done that, but I want to explicitly call out define a basis because that's what my, that's step number two. And that's, and I asked you in the homework assignment, what's your basis? So name that, see explicitly, your basis should be, and if you're saying basis, what's a basis? So a basis is a question you ask or a procedure or something that allows you to, in a, in a sort of a systematic way, break a large set into subsets. And I don't know, I don't, I, the word basis I have found, I've used this word in the past, it's the standard word used for equivalence partitioning. Um, sometimes it's not intuitively clear to people what that is. So if you don't understand basis, then we'll just call it a, just make up a word. Assume it's a word in a foreign language and I'm now defining it for you as um, a test or criterion that is used to um, determine whether elements in a large set should be in subset A or subset B or subset C or subset D or however many subsets you, you have. So, um, for instance, let me just give you a really bad basis, and I don't want to see this showing up in homework three. You could say, um, does the teacher's name have an X in it? Okay, so that's lousy, but you could, that divides the set of all inputs. Some of the inputs involve teachers with an X in their name. They go in this bucket. And some of the inputs involve teachers without an X in any place in the name, and they go in that bucket. But now, what's the problem with using X in the name as a, as a, as a, as a basis? It doesn't really help us. Yeah, it doesn't help us. So it's a lousy basis because it's, it's very, very unlikely that the ranking functionality will have anything to do with X in the teacher's name. You could argue, yeah, how do you know? It's black box testing. We don't know how the program is, executed, is, is implemented. We don't have the source code. Maybe it does. And so I guess I would have to say, yeah, you're right. Maybe it does. <coughs> try it. If you have all the time in the world, try it. But the reality is you don't have all the time in the world. And when you're testing, you have to be smart. And you have to choose. It's, it's good to choose bases that at least have some relationship to to the actual data and what's happening. But you don't, you don't have the source code, so you don't really know, and you might well choose a basis that doesn't, isn't, doesn't turn out to be all that interesting. And don't worry about that. Don't feel like, you know, we're not going to be too picky on the bases as long as they have something to do with what we're talking about. So maybe your basis could be, um, well, I don't want to give anything away. So. Anyway, does that kind of make sense? So you choose the basis. That gives you some subsets, maybe two or three or four or five or six. And then from each of those, you choose one instance, and you fill out the, the matrix. Could you give us an example on a different problem instead? Can I give you an example of a basis on a different problem? Yeah. Well, we've done this in class a few times. Can I repeat one that we've already done? A new one, please. Uh, a new one. OK. Um, let's suppose, um, suppose, uh, Ugh. I, don't, I don't want to choose anyone that's too programmer because I know some of you really aren't programmers. 
Um, let's suppose we want to test whether, um, uh, well, we did the soda machine, but let's suppose instead of the soda machine, it's the snack machine. Has anyone here used the snack machine over by the ICF building, where you put in a dollar or two and then you press E4 for stale peanuts, or A3 for broken up cookies? Some of you have, but no, you had the same experience as me. Uh, okay, so let's do that. Okay, is that different enough? So what are our, first of all, we have to start at number one. What's our input to the snack machine? Shout it out, come on. No one here has ever used the snack machine? Snacks, okay. So there need to be snacks in the snack machine. What else? What else? Money. Money, okay. The, the, the user, the snacks are put in by the, the owner, or some representative of the owner. The money is put in by the client, or the user. What else is input? Pitching on the number. The, it's a letter number combination. Let's put it that way. Okay, you type in E3 or something. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Let's say that's good enough. We probably could think of other things, but. Let's say snacks, money, dollar amount, you know, amount of money, and choice of E3 or whatever. Okay, so that's our input for our purposes. What's the basis for dividing? Obviously, there are many, many inputs, individual inputs. What's our basis for, what's a possible basis for dividing this large set of inputs into a subset? Multiple subsets. You could have a button press based on the letter, A, B, C, D, E. Which letter? Okay. Which letter in the button press? And there are, it's probably like A through J or something like that. There's approximately 10 different letters. So we could have 10 subsets. All inputs that begin, that involve a button, a button number combo that have the first letter is A. So let me give you a sample input for that. The snacks are... 10 Cheez-Its and 12 ring things and et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to name it all, but all those wonderful, healthy snacks. And the dollar input is, is two $1 bills, and the button press is A3. That's a specific test case. What's my expected output? Someone want to run over to? The expected output is ring dings and 50 cents pass, or something like that, right? So what's another, using that basis, what's another subset? Well, all the ones that begin with a B. We could have 10 subsets if there are 10 letters. And that's the sort of the natural thing for that. OK? Does that make sense? Could you do that with subbooby? Okay, Don't have ring dings coming out. For our input uh, box, we have to put like, a lot of information in that, right? For the input box, do you mean on the Sabubi website? Sabubi, because like if we, we you mean on the Sabubi website, or do you mean on the matrix, the testing matrix? Test, the testing matrix. Okay, so the testing matrix, you don't need to put in all, if it doesn't fit conveniently. I'm not really too concerned about the format. If it fits conveniently, you can put it it on the matrix. You can put that information, or you could say I'm going to define, say, teacher. George Washington have these characteristics, and you can put that earlier in your document, and then just say George Washington, and we know you mean George Washington with this SSN and this PIN and this school and this classroom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to put that all on the matrix. You know, you know physically typed in. So organize it in a way that makes it readable. But think of it from the perspective of you might actually give this matrix to a junior intern tester person and say, now run these test cases. So there needs to be enough information to, to, to actually do the test case. So don't just put in some teacher at some school. Name a school. You can name school anything you want. First put in a few starter schools, but I don't think that there's, we don't have a separate database of valid schools. You can use your high school. Okay? I'm getting a stun. Okay, uh, yeah, we get it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go with stun. Okay.
Um, oh boy. Let's. Let's just review some schedule changes. Yeah. Is there a length requirement? Yeah. For like? There wasn't a length requirement for assignment one either. And I rule the day that I said five to ten pages because it said I got asked that many times. Uh, no, there's no length requirement. Right. Two bases, each with some subdivisions. How you, how many pages that takes, we don't care. We're not at all looking at pages. Okay, just to make sure everyone's on sync, a few schedule changes. No lecture on Thursday. No discussions on Friday. I see people tapping their cheeks. They're crying. <laughs> Finally, no. <laughs> Final exam on Thursday, that's no, not a change, just a reminder. Final exam, same time as scheduled from the very beginning. In this room, 8 a.m. sharp. Usual seating, seating deal. We'll reserve a few rows at the back for latecomers. I'm sure everyone will be up and bright and tipper at 8 a.m. Uh, but we'll try and start right on time. You can leave when you're done. Uh, probably some of you will leave quickly. Uh, close book, close notes, no calculators. Any other final exam questions? I don't think you'll be surprised in the slightest by the format or the specific question. I hope not. Okay. Uh, no office hours on Thursday either. I've got, I'm going to be off campus Thursday morning. That's the reason for this. But instead, I'll have alternate uh, office hours on Wednesday and later on Thursday. Okay? So feel free to stop by my office, Donald Van Hall 5058. If you have questions about homework three or um, anything else related to the course, or anything unrelated to the course. Okay. I think. It's time for clickers. For the last time, the answer this right, but that's okay. Choose your, do your best. If you follow all the links in the readings, you'll know what I'm talking about, but you didn't have to. Popped out at 169. Oh, wow. We'll give it one minute. So you had to follow the link on Nerd Sniper. Anyone notice that link and not follow it? Probably. Lots of you. Very good. Very good. A lot of people did, did follow it. So if you don't know what we're talking about, go back to it and Follow the nerd sniping link. How could you not follow the nerd term nerd sniping? <laughs> How could you not be curious what that was all about? Okay, Cupid, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Computer scientists are fours. Okay. All right. Um, so here's maybe a little bit more content. Another one, a little bit more content oriented, but still a little bit. Okay. I think everyone 
everyone knows schadenfreude, what that means? Joy at the sufferings of others? Uh, especially a friend, right? Joy at the, your friend, something goes wrong and it kind of makes you happy a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> the lack of recognition. <laughs> We've all felt it. <laughs> Come on, we should be able to get back up to 171. <laughs> Okay, well that's going to have to do. Okay. <laughs> there's, no, there's no right answer here, but that's you know, what your reaction was. It's kind of interesting that... Uh, so one of the things that I wanted you to get out of this a little bit, though it's really pretty tangential, is what's the role of math in, in doing things. And you know, there's always a, a school of thought that says math is so important and if you don't know, you know, advanced whatever that you don't really can't really be on whatever, whatever the job is. And then there are always people, other people who say, I've never used that in my life. So I don't have an answer, I don't have an opinion. Um, but it's it's an interesting topic. Let's look at the actual um, So um, the main reason I wanted to bring this up is I wanted to talk a little bit in this class about sort of really the user interface, the user experience, the user interaction design side of software engineering. It's super, super important. Um, it tends to sometimes, as in this class, it sort of gets tacked on at the end. But it really can be the driving idea behind software engineering. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But I just wanted, before we talked about sort of, as in general, I wanted to sort of make sure you had all seen a specific example of something kind of prosaic in every day, like, you know, sort of drop down sub menus. And it's a, but you can see, if you read this carefully and thought about it, that there's actually a lot of subtlety here. And people, I see like three fourths of people just mesmerized at these <laughs> looking, turning things. So, you know, it is, it is kind of fascinating, but let's, uh, Let's go to that. Um, so, um, rather than being, my, my interest is not particularly fascination with submenus, but just it's something that you can spend a lot of time at, and if done well, works really nicely, but to do it well requires really thinking about how do people do things, and in this case, it's kind of just how does the mouse move, which is you know, kind of on the simple side, but there's a lot of, a lot of things in this category that are a little bit more complex. How do you, you know, you type in a search and then you go to this screen and then how do you know how to get back or, you know, things like that. And a little bit more transaction and traversal of what, what does a person have in their head. And so, for instance, I'm sure you've all had the experience of searching for something and if you don't know the word of what you're searching for, it's awfully hard to find it, right? So what's, what do you do? How do you do it? Like yesterday, I, was, I had a friend in grad school and all of a sudden I was wondering, I haven't seen him in 20 years, I wonder what he's doing. Unfortunately, I don't remember his name. So how do you find someone whose name you don't remember? Well, it took me a while, but then I remembered a friend in common. And I, and I remembered my friend, our friend in common's name, and who I also haven't seen for a long time. And then those two people had written a paper together. And so when I was looking through our mutual friends' list of publications, there I saw the other guy's name. So, you know, and so that's the sort of a mental process I go through. Is there some way that could be captured in a web page or a search engine or something like that? Well, probably that, probably not. But you know, there are other. That's the sort of question: is really what's going on in people's minds and how do they react and what information do you want to give them in what order? It's a really interesting perspective on software engineering, and, and it's a really can be the driving perspective in a way. Um, so that's the that's sort of what I want. I wanted you to read this. Also, this is just an interesting. Um, it does an interesting blog post because he does have these automated, you know, he isn't just telling you this, he's actually showing you this. I guess these are uh, little, little gifs. And then I thought that the comments were kind of interesting, so I don't really have much to 
particularly say about them. Did anyone read any comments that they thought, wow, it was just what I thought, or I was completely off base? Or... So the other thing I wanted you just to be aware of, and I couldn't remember whether it had come up yet in this class, is, um, here we go, is Hacker News. And I think I mentioned it, but if you're interested in kind of the, the world of entrepreneurial software development, this is definitely a website to check in on every once in a while and see what's going on. It will, it will I think, initially be a lot of people talking about things you have no idea what they are. But as you read and sort of are interested and maybe follow things up, you begin to learn some of the vocabulary and some of the perspective and some of the assumptions that people are making. And if, you know, if, if you're interested in that world, not everyone wants to be a hacker or an entrepreneur or start your own company. You know, not everyone here wants to make a billion dollars, and that's okay. So, but if you, if you are interested in that combination of things, this is definitely a must read at least every day or two or three sort of website. So, and in general, they have pretty good comments on on things. In other words, this is one of these sites like Reddit. I mean, it's the same software as Reddit um, with sort of nested comments. And I think that in itself is an interesting user experience sort of thing. Okay, so that was mostly uh, something I wanted to show you to lead into other things, which we will get back to in a minute. Um, let's see. I've got all these different PowerPoints this time. But I couldn't finish a course on software engineering without talking a little bit about Moore's Law. And because it is perhaps, the, it embodies the main thing that's been driving our entire field of computer science and software engineering and computer engineering and everything else for the last 60 or so years. Um, and I'm sure you've all probably heard the term Moore's Law, and you may or may not have any idea what it means, so let's just spend a minute on that. So Moore's Law is, the number of transistors on integrated circuits doubles approximately every two years. So what's an uh, integrated circuit? Well, it's a software course, not hardware course. But it's, it's, a, it's a chip. It's a little computery thing. And what's a transistor? Right, so it's sort of a switch, right? You can turn things on or off, and with, with transistors, you can build more complex logic that will then do things like ands and ors, or add numbers together, or play video games. So it's sort of the building block of all, almost all uh, computer stuff. So, um, so here's just a picture from uh, 1969. This was one of the original early integrated circuits, and it um, did 108,000 instructions per second. Pretty darn fast. So that KH is kilohertz. A hertz is um, means one one thing per second. So if you a kilohertz is a thousand things per second, and this is 108,000 things per second. What are those things? Well, like add numbers together or move data around in memory. Uh, fairly recent, the uh, Intel Core i7. Uh, 306 gigahertz, that's a lot faster, right? A gigahertz is a billion, so we're basically going from um, 100,000 to a billion, so that's a lot faster. And it's also got a lot more. I, I couldn't find the number of transistors, but it's billions. Um, and uh, so yeah, those are just pictures, obviously, larger than my size. So why, does it, why is it important um, if the number of transistors doubles? Well, the transistor stays at about the same size. So if you put twice as many on, they're closer to each other, and that means they're faster, because a lot of the time, a lot of what takes time is moving electrons and such from one point to another point. If you make those points closer to each other, they go faster. Also, they're more powerful. They can do more things. They can add more numbers, and they can, you know, they just, there's power in other ways. There's, um, the cost stays about the, about the same per transistor. I mean, per, sorry, per uh, integrated circuit. Not exactly, but the cost is about the same. In other words, a few hundred dollars. So if we can get a lot more transistors on for the same cost, then they're faster and the price is going down. And that's really nice. Right. That doesn't happen in most fields, right? Um, automobiles over the last 50 or 60 years have not gotten 
half as expensive and twice as powerful every two years. Like you may have known. And same for just about everything else. Books are about the same. But somehow, for reasons that are really good in this class, it is happening in computer technology. So it's good to know that Moore's Law is named after a real man named Gordon Moore, who in 1965 published in a journal called Electronics a article called Framing More Components onto Integrated Circuits, using the technical term, framing. And Gordon Moore went on to found Intel, which I know you've heard of. And here's the, here's the picture from his original 1965 paper, where he took four data points, or five data points, from 1959 62, 63, 64, 65, notice that they were kind of linear and extrapolated. So he's writing this in 65. The dash is my guess, or his guess. Okay. Now this is a straight line because the x-axis is kind of the normal x-axis. Well, each you know, centimeter is a year or whatever it is. But he, this is the logarithm of, logarithm of the number of um, uh, components. So remember, if you double a number, the log goes up by 1, right? If we go from 100 to 200, the log of 100 is half the log of 200, okay? So when the log, so even though it looks like a straight line, it doesn't mean that from 1962 to 1963, um, it just went up like from 3 to 4. It went from 2 to the 3 to 2 to the 4, which is twice as much. Okay, so I know some of you are totally familiar with log charts. But some of you probably never understood them and still don't. So that was more right in 1965. As it turned out, he was right. And here's um, a chart that starts in 1970 and shows various, um, uh, for the most part, Intel processors. And you can see it's still a pretty straight line. Here, rather than having the log, we show the actual number. So this is 10,000, which is 10 log 3, 10 log 4, 10 log 5, uh, 10 raised to the fourth to the th and raise the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. So you can see the straight line thing is is pretty 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 reasonable. And here's since this was just to 2000, um, here's some more data up through 2010. And the with red is Motorola chips and blue is Intel chips. So this isn't something that's just you know one company or something. And it's still pretty much a straight line, right? Still, once again, logarithmic here. So it's kind of amazing. And then here's another way of looking at it, is the hardware has gotten faster, but how about the software? So here's what I've done. I superimposed on the same chart as before, um, Windows, uh, Microsoft operating systems, Windows 3.1, 95, 98, Windows NT, Windows XP, and over here, how many millions of lines of code, also, also on a logarithmic scale. So you can see that as the chips got faster, Windows got larger at pretty much the same rate. And of course, that's just Windows. But it turns out people have done this for other pieces of software. And in general, it's the same thing. Uh, so software has, computers have gotten faster. Software has gotten bigger. Software has only gotten faster for the most part because um, because the underlying computer that's running on has gotten faster. It's not that software is necessarily much better than it was 20 or 30 years ago. But what's the main limiting factor in all of this? Not hardware. Software grows. What doesn't change? <laughs> There's been no perceptible increase in human intelligence over the last 50 or 60 years. Okay, so that's kind of a big picture thing. I'm not going to directly relate to software engineering, but everything in software and hardware is sort of driven by this Moore's Law. Uh, Henry Samueli, who I know you've heard of because he funded, he didn't found, but he funded the engineering school, which is the same Henry Samueli Engineering School, and he runs a very large chip making company on campus. Um, he gave a talk about his predictions for the future of these things a month or two ago on campus. And if you ever hear about Henry Samueli giving a talk on campus, I would say, go see it. He's interesting. And rich. <laughs> so I'll just finish this up with a... I don't know. 
Something I'm, I, I've been afraid about all quarter long is that maybe you guys are suffering from PowerPoint poisoning. Normally I don't use PowerPoints in this class, and I don't know if you can believe that, but this one was so large, and I thought if I write on the board, people in the back will be able to see it, so we're doing PowerPoints. You'll, you'll recover over the summer, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so that was a little aside on, on Moore's Law, obviously. We didn't want to run out of time on that. So, yeah. Um, I heard some people say that Moore's Law is not true anymore. We can't really uh, make as much uh, transistors every. Okay, so the comment is. Some people have said that Moore's Law and Santa Claus are not true. They're true. Well, here's, I don't know about Santa Claus, but here's the thing with Moore's Law. It's still true, meaning like Intel's prediction for what we're going to, what they're going to be releasing two or three years from now, you know, it's really in the pipeline already and they're building the factories already, it still holds with that. So Samueli, who founded Broadcom and knows about these things, because they make chips too, thought it would continue through the mid-2020s. And then he was very dubious about it continuing on past that. But then there's always the possibility of completely new computing paradigms like biological computing or quantum computing. I don't know. I'm not a hardware engineer, so I don't know any more than any of you guys do. OK, so, so the point of asking you to read the little thing on the, on the drop down or, or pop out menus was as an example of something that has many different names but it's often called user interaction design or user experience design. Um, it all, it's a focus on the user interface. It's sometimes called UX, user and ex experience design. So if, like you see a job posting that might say, we want a UX engineer or something like that. And it's kind of a broad term, meaning someone who's really focusing on how does this work for the user? Don't just think of it as a user interface, this, this static thing that just sits there and the user knows what to do. Really think about naive people and experts and what do they do and how do they move their mouse and you know and I think I tried to give you some example of that with that blog posting. And here's a quote from Hacker News. It's probably a great testament to its good design that I failed to notice how well it works when browsing Amazon. Everyone notices awful drop down menus and I really don't like bootstraps. Everyone know what bootstrap is? You all downloaded bootstrap. That's that bootstrap. But good ones like this often pass unnoticed because they work so well. And of course, that's the great thing about all good design is if it's really something really well designed, you don't notice it or you say, oh yeah, of course. That's obvious. Of course it's that way. You know, you look at an iPhone and you say, oh yeah, sure. That's what I would have done too. But <laughs> it's not that easy. Okay, so I wanted to spend at least a little bit of time on another set of slides, um, which are interesting to me and I hope hopefully to you because they cover a lot of the same things that I've been covering in this course over the last nine and a half weeks, but from a completely different perspective. Um, so let's see. And here's my link. Okay, so this is someone else's slides, so that's always sort of a weird thing for me to give someone else's slides because some things I don't know what they're talking about. But some things are very, you'll see why it's interesting. So um, user experience design and user testing. So what is user experience design? Why should we care? How can we apply UX processes? How can we measure its effectiveness? Who needs to be involved? See, I don't know how many times I have to press the key here. So what is it? So it's some or all of these. So you can see that there's a lot of things that probably to you are just words, but there are people who specialize in each one of these. And if you're kind of interested in this area of software creation, then you know go back to this and look up these terms and, and get more familiar with them. Uh, information design, which is really yet the sort of it's not yet at the user visible. It's like the underlying information, um, information architecture. We'll talk about all these, interaction design, visual design, human factors, cognition, usability, accessibility. So for instance, there's a big, there's a big component of software design that says accessibility. How easy is this to use for someone who's deaf, blind, you know, 
not fully functional in some other way, maybe fingers or something like that, or maybe some cognitive impairment. And that's a large actor, or some old even, you know, like maybe over 50. And that's a large segment of the population. And should not be, certainly should not be ignored. Uh, so here's just some adjectives, you know. For instance, we want things to be findable. You know, those of us with strong visual sense, and maybe we can find things just by quickly looking over a screen, and we kind of know well, if we click here, we're likely to go to where we want, you know, like how can I find my uh, graduate school classmate from 20 years ago? But, you know, not everyone figures that out on their own. There's a lot of blanks. Okay. Okay, so let's pull that all together in one. So here's an interesting sort of perspective where at the base you have the user's needs and the site objectives. So he's definitely thinking website in this, in this. But this doesn't just imply the web. It could be any kind of application or something that runs on the on the on a computer, you know, as a stand, you know, a game or something that's just on the computer and not part of the web. And then on top of that, or based on that, are the functional specifications, such as you wrote, and content requirements. Um, and then on top of that is interface design, navigation design, information design. And then on top of that is the visual side of things. You know, what colors you're using, where do you place things on the screen. Anyone read this book? So let me just say, this is one of the best books I've ever read. And I'm not a big comics fan. It is just so interesting. I so encourage you to go get a copy. Understanding comics. And you'll see a little bit of it. So, I mean, this guy just has interesting things to say about everything. So he says, the author of this book, Scott McCloud, says, all creative endeavors follow a path consisting of six steps. Idea, form, idiom, structure, craft, surface. What does this remind you of? Waterfall model. Oh, these slides on the web don't have, have some things missing. But thankfully, I went and photocopied it myself. So the first step is the idea, the impulses, idea, emotions, philosophies, purposes of the work, the work's content. Now, he's thinking, you know, art. In, so, in some aspect of software is art, but obviously a lot of it is very economically motivated. And so we could add to this, as software developers, we could add to this um, business needs, um, scientific needs, you know, company, fulfill the needs of the company, things like that. The form it will take, will it be a book, chalk drawing, chair, song, sculpture, pot holder, comic book? Or once again, a more software-centric, we could say app, website, standalone downloaded application that runs on the PC or the Mac, something like that. The school of art, the vocabulary of styles or gestures or subject matter, the genre that the work belongs to, maybe a genre of its own. What does that sound like? Right, architectural style. Left, right to everyone's mind. Fourth, putting it all together. What to include, what to leave out, how to arrange, how to compose the work. Okay, so now, as it just turns out, the website, ah. That was one through four that I provided you. Okay, for some reason, five and six are back on the website. <laughs> Fifth, constructing the work, applying skills, practical knowledge, invention, problem solving, getting the job done. Um, so in, in software terms, this would be a lot of the design and all the implementation and testing, probably. Produ production values, finishing the surface characteristics, the aspects that, that are most apparent when someone first comes to something. You know, you go to a website and you say, oh, nice color scheme, or it's laid out in a way that I understand, or something like that. Okay. So this is, these are the six steps again. And so he, the, now the 
not not uh, Scott McLeod who did this wonderful book, but um, which is all comic, by the way. It's all in the form of comic. Um, turns that into six sort of equivalent things in software development, which as we've noticed, looks a little bit like the waterfall model. Needs, specs, information architecture, interaction design, visual design, coding, testing, and QA. So all those things that you've spent years, and those of you who are like computer science juniors or something, you've spent years and years doing, they all just fit into six. And that's part of the point, is I want to show you sort of, once again, this is a whole, all, all software engineering, but from a very different perspective. And, I don't know, have any, of you ever had, have any of you ever had the experience of like your cousins from Florida come to visit and they say, show me around the town and you get a completely different experience of your own town? You go to things, oh, I never went to that famous thing that everyone goes to when they come to our town. It's like the New Yorker who's never been to the Statue of Liberty here. Though. When I moved to California, I called up my cousin who lived, who was born here, she lived his entire life here, and said, so what should I do when we go to Death Valley? He said, oh, I've never been to Death Valley. You live in California, you've never been to Death Valley? Well, you know, it's always there, right? <laughs> so if you haven't been to Death Valley, it's absolutely worth going, but uh, maybe wait a few months. It's hot. Okay. So the first early stages are market and user research, and then the user experience team, and then the part that most of us identify with, but not all of us, development and QA teams. So different people are involved, multi-person uh, process. And so here's back to the Scott McLeod book, just pointing out that you can sort of go from an inner core to an outer core, and in the book he, he, he spends a lot more time on this that isn't in this lecture, but I just went back and reread it, read, read it last night, it's very interesting. Um, but people see the surface, but the surface, just having the surface by itself is not enough. Um, if we bite into that shiny new apple and it's empty, then yuck. So you can't start from the surface. You can't say, oh, there's something cool on the web that we need to have on our website, so you just photocopy it and paste it onto your website. That's not how it works, right? You need to start from underlying what's the needs and you know, do some magic. You need to start from needs and go through this whole process. You can't just get to the end here. Now you can if it's a small enough thing that either you hold it completely in your mind and one person is dealing with it, one person is conceiving it, or maybe no one else is going to use it besides you, then you don't need to go through this process. But we're talking about large scale professional level things. So, uh, as always, we start with the high level requirements. Oh, provide voting information to U.S. seniors. Or play a, you know, make this a fun game. But we don't make any decisions about form or design. How did I, how did I phrase that earlier in the quarter? That's right. Focus on what not happen. Yeah, get that straight. <laughs> on what not happen. What we want to do is provide voting info to U.S. seniors or teach students how to trade stocks. Let's get that clear in our mind, and then figure out how to do it. How do you address those needs? So now with the how. So, you know, tutorials, <coughs> office tool, stock market contest. We're not really designing it. I mean, you know, the what to how is not just a binary thing. It's a, it's a process. And you can have high levels and lower levels. So we're getting a little bit of how. And then you start talking about, you know, you start really laying it out and coming up with boxes and how they relate to each other. And, this is one approach that some people do, is they take all these little pieces of paper, uh, these, all these little ideas and things that don't necessarily fit together, and they write them on sticky notes and put them up on a wall, and then move the sticky notes around, and sometimes it works nicely, and some sort of, you realize you've got a few different categories of, of things. So information architecture, um, well, it doesn't talk too much about that. Interaction design. So, you know, how are people going to interact with the, you know, are people going to be at this place and then go to there, or what are they going to want to do, or do you have, if you're at A and you want to go to C, do you have to go through B, or can you go directly to C? And you can do that at a high level and then a much more detailed level. 
Um, you can sketch out what the user interface will be like. Wireframe means you're just trying to, just the outline. You're not trying to get everything just right. Um, but it's just a sort of a high level view and you don't fill in, as you can see here, they're not filling, you know, it's just sort of lines just to indicate something comes there. You can do paper prototyping. <coughs> paper prototyping is something we did in the previous and wireframes. We did last year in this class. I didn't do it this year because it's kind of hard just to organize it with a big class. Anyway, so I'm not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to, uh, I mean, there's a lot here, but I just want to give you the sense that, that uh, a sort of a different perspective on software engineering than what I've been doing. So now we can do the visual design, how it looks and how it works. So for instance, if you lay out something like this with a big picture and then some things here, you know, we don't even have to really be able to look at the individual words, right? We can just sort of say, okay, at the top is something that looks like a header, a navigation bar, and then there's an image. And what is it, what is it, what's the feel it gives you to have a big image taking up more than 50% of the screen? Why would someone do that? <coughs> the thinking is, it humanizes, it gives people something to relate to, it looks less techy, it, it, you know, some people are dealing with the computer and some of us are known to love computers, but a lot of people aren't. And they see, oh, it's a dog. I always love this site so much. It's a big picture of a dog. <laughs> Um, then there's items, and it looks, you know, sort of just from the, our expectations, it looks like there are certain things in certain places. Because we, we've all been to enough websites now that we sort of have certain expectations, and probably you're best off if you flow with that. Site layout should conform to our expectations based on our experiences. Of course, sometimes you want to say, no, I'm going to explode all that. I'm going to do something completely different. This is an interesting one. Make functionality more obvious. So I'm not, you know, the inactive should look inactive. The active should look active. Or here's a cancel and submit. Maybe this is a better cancel and submit. Why would this, why would these two choices be better than these two? The yeah, yeah. We, some people are going to relate to icons like a big X or a check mark faster and better than they're going to relate to words. And I would claim that the word submit is a really lousy word to use in this case anyway, right? Submit? Who are you submitting to? Or cancel and then submit, which means that means we're going to go on to someplace. That means we're moving forward. We're progressing. The arrow is a, you know, if you ask a three-year-old what an arrow means, a three-year-old will know. That's a really basic symbol in the West, at least. Um, if you're interested in these things, Don Norman's a good guy to read. And he's written uh, The Design of Everyday Things. Really good. So if this, is the side, if this is the side of software and computers and stuff that you're interested in, which is great, it's a really big field, it's really interesting, um, read Don Norman. Which do you feel would work better? How many people say the one on the left? How many people say the one on the right? So, people have different opinions. <laughs> I don't know. How it looks is how well it works. Ah, that's a little strange, I think. <laughs> but effective design. So, how does it affect you? Does it give you pleasure to use it? There's no question about it. There's some pleasure to holding a little box like this. It's just the right size. It makes you feel like you've got something, right? I mean, if you don't feel that, okay. But lots of people do feel that. And it's like they don't want to put down this magical device. Okay, so we need to actually build working products. It, you know, the, the great thing about software is that it's not just, it's not like it's just a cartoon, that even though cartoons have this kind of dynamic movement from panel to panel, they are ultimately static. It's published there. Software works. It's a machine. It has to work. So there's coding, testing, and QA. This deserves its own slideshow, but it's not going to get it here. But as you know, it deserves its own three or four quarter sequence, which many of you are in the middle of or have taken. Okay, so user testing. So he's just going to skip all that stuff. Right? That's the technical stuff. 
user testing. In other words, you can have all your great ideas, but actually try it out on some users and double check your assumptions. Now here's an interesting mixed metaphor. If done well, helps nail low-hanging fruit. What does the metaphor of low-hanging fruit mean? It means it's the easy thing to reach, right? The apple at the top of the tree. Anyone here ever picked apples in October? Oh, you should do it. Fine. And there are apples at the top of the tree, up 25 feet, and there are apples that are like 6 feet. And the apples at 6 feet taste just as good. And they're low-hanging, so those are the ones you go for first. And what does it mean to nail something? It means different things, right? What, has anyone ever nailed a low-hanging fruit? This is a mixed metaphor. <laughs> I think that would be hard to do. So I don't know. So there's something called Silverback. Google Analytics, um, this is something you should know about, probably some of you do, is that as you go to a website, you are tracked. Maybe not you individually, but maybe you individually, of course. Um, but maybe just the fact that, um, let me just give you another example, I think. Yeah, A-B testing. So A-B testing means you make two different versions of your website, one in which the button is blue and one in which the button is red, or something like that. And you, people randomly get one version or the, or the other version, and then they keep track of how many people click on the button which says purchase product or something like that. And maybe they find that the blue works better than the red. So they do that for a few days. They're getting this data back in real time. They say, oh, blue works better. And all of a sudden, everyone's getting the blue button. And the company's making a lot of money. So A-B testing means you have two versions of something. And you try them both out, maybe randomly, or maybe one state gets A and one state gets B or something like that. The big websites are doing this all the time. Amazon, Facebook, all the time they're doing it. And you may or may not be aware of it because you may not get the the, the new version of something, or you may not notice. But they're very carefully observing these and doing analytics means then find, getting the results. Do people go f tend to get to where they want to go faster, or do they buy more, or whatever, with these different UX uh, things. So Google makes it easy to do that and provides a lot of, uh, of the software structure. So we won't worry about that too much, but um, you should be aware of it. <laughs> um, OK, so here's the development cycle, very different from the waterfall model in some ways, but very similar to the waterfall model in other ways. Though they don't want this to be, uh, oh, a rinse and repeat. <laughs> so it's waterfall, but it's not. Um, you just go through once, right? So you can go back a lot. It has a life cycle. You can go back, oops, you can go back to, from one place to a previous place. So there, there is a, so what he's saying here is that there is this sort of a linear sequence, but he's not making any claim that when you get to some place, you never have to go back. But still, there is, you sort of have to do the, the inside things, needs and specs. Now remember, think of the apple metaphor, or sort of inside the, the outer things, like, uh, uh, visual design. Okay, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Oh, let's see what else we got. So that's sort of an interesting thing. UX design, what's usable, useful, and desirable. Product management, the business side of things, what's needed and therefore valuable. And engineering, what's possible and what's not. So people whose majors at least indicate that you have these different interests are all in this class, and uh, there's an overlap. And even if, you know, we're talk we've talked about things in this class that you realize, oh, okay, I don't want to do that. I never want to write another requirements document in my life. Um, it's good to know that people do it, right? And it's good to know what they're doing. Oh, it's not linear, it's a cycle. Better products, happier users. Okay. So that's um, uh, kind of, that enabled me to wrap up the entire quarter without having to write my own slides. Uh, so that's a, that's a plus. But,
since I do like writing my own slides, I just added a few more. I couldn't let the last, the last slide I show you be somebody else. So um, it seems to me that the core, and this is to me, who started off as a programmer and, and has a degree in computer science, that the, in some ways the core of what's going on here is things like programming, algorithms, data structures, debugging, ICS 21, 31, 22, whatever courses you've taken on that or are going to take in the future, focus on these things. Um, and that's, it's not, that's not all of computer science, but that's certainly the, the, the core of both computer science and engineering. But what software engineering adds to this is two more dimensions. I, I sort of think of this as a sort of one sort of nugget or one central idea. But it adds two things. One is people, okay? And of course, I'm thinking about multi-person, multi-version notion. So uh, if you just think about, uh, if, if you're doing all this stuff, programming algorithms, data structure, debugging with one person, then that's fine. But that's only a small subset of what actually gets done in the real world. In the real world, there are many people involved, and they have different roles, skills, and interests. So maybe their role is UX engineer, or their role is um, customer or user, or their interests are maybe it's another programmer or another person working with you, but someone who has somewhat different interests or skills. So a large part of software engineering is acknowledging this and sort of saying, okay, we want to, this is the reality, we have people involved. That makes it a lot more complex, but perhaps more interesting, depending on your interests. And so we want to take that into account. So that's one dimension, is, is multiple people. And then the other dimension is time. So time always, always exists, of course. But in, um, if you're just thinking about programming something, you generally are thinking, okay, I need to get this program and written, and then it's sort of this, it's sort of like I've just mined and made a diamond. But the diamond is now forever, right? It's not gonna change, it's sort of this static little thing. But software engineering says, no, nothing is static, things change. We have versions, we have maintenance, we have um, changing needs over time. Um, so we need to plan for that. We need to design for change. We need to modularize in a way that makes maintenance easy. We need to sort of be aware of that from the very beginning. And that has repercussions throughout the entire process and everything we do. So together, all those three things, this, this core sort of programming stuff, but then also, of course, you know, things like, I mean, now look, looking at this slide, I feel bad that I didn't include UX design somewhere. Um, but there's a whole panoply of other things that get involved and those all make up software engineering. So I think I'll leave on that note. Let me just remind you. I don't have any more clickers. Let's just leave on this note. Um, different, different office hours this week. And then don't forget the final exam next week. Okay, see you there. This room.